Hello and welcome to this CUBE Conversation exclusive. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE. We have Matt Garman, SVP of Sales and Marketing for AWS. Matt formerly ran for a long time the EC2 team, which we know is the compute in the cloud, which is which really changed the game. It's a core product, but want to continue to, to get more compute, big part of it. Of course, Matt led that team. Now he runs sales and marketing and global services for AWS. And of course, he's a CUBE alumni. Matt is here to talk about the surge in generative AI and Amazon's role in bringing that value to the enterprise and the ISV. Matt, thanks for joining me today and joining our podcast. Great, John, nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me back. Great to see you. I know you guys got a lot going on. I reported the other day that you guys announced the AI initiative and a lot of people were jumping on the Amazon's catching up kind of bandwagon. You guys have been doing AI for a long time. Many have saw that. And even Jim Cramer from CNBC publicly walked back his comments, acknowledging Amazon's deep work in ML and AI. Let's start yeah. off by clearing the air on Adam's position. You know, it's history. Andy Jassy always said, there's no compression algorithm for experience. You guys have that. Briefly explain the history, the trajectory, and the experience AWS has with MLAI. Yeah, happy to do it. So, so at Amazon and, and AWS, we've been super focused on AI and ML and, and have long felt for, for frankly 20 years, we've been working on the space and, and have known that this is, has been and will continue to transform how companies do business. And so, um, like you said, we've, we've had an expertise in this for a really long time. And at AWS in particular, our focus is always on how do we help our customers get the most out of new technologies that come up. And I think uh, recently, lots of folks, uh, us included, are incredibly excited about the potential that generative AI has to fully transform lots and lots of industries and businesses. And when customers think about that, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that we don't just toss a, a brand new technology out there, but we want to really be sure that customers can leverage it in a safe, effective way that makes sense for their business. And, um, and that's how we really think about this space. It's an area that we've been deeply investing in um, and uh, an area that we feel passionate about. We'll help our AWS customers and our customers all over the world really transform their business. And we think the approach that we're taking in AWS uh, is ultimately how most customers are going to want to consume and uh, build generative AI into the applications that they run. Yeah, I definitely want to get into those approaches and some of the experiences you've had. But before we dive into some of the questions around the product opportunities, I have to get your reaction to all these conversations on banning, banning AI from the enterprise, Goldman Sachs to Apple, who even just last week banned employees from using chat GPT. Even regulation is rearing its ugly head. What's going on here? Why are people freaking out yep. about AI? I mean, it's too early to ban in my opinion, or even regulate. What is your position on this? How do you see this playing out? What's, what's going on? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I think ban is a, is a fun word that people like to use, but, but that's not really it. I think what you read is, is that when ChatGPT came out, it really uh, inspired and caused a, lot, a broad swath of people to really understand what the power of AI was. And that's, that's where a lot of us have been working uh, on this for a long time, but it did a great job of really kind of bringing into the public consciousness of what's possible. And so I think you saw a lot of people get really excited and want to jump in quickly. And I think when you look at what some of the banks are doing or what some of the companies are doing, they're not so much banning the idea of generative AI. They're encouraged, I mean, they're, they're putting the brakes on their own teams to be careful about putting their own IP into those systems. Part of how those systems learn, like ChatGPT and others, is that when you enter questions in, when you put data into that system, it takes that system, integrates it into what's it, what it knows, and then it builds a broader corpus of knowledge that it can go answer questions from. And so a lot of companies are, you know, banning, they're, they're putting the brakes in so that they have the right controls and security in place so that their own IP doesn't leak into those models. And I think that's appropriate. It's, in fact, when I talk to customers and enterprises, one of the things that they're most uh, worried about is that they understand that in the future, their own IP and their data is actually what gets, what's going to be one of the most valuable and differentiating things that they have going forward. And so, what they're, they're putting in place is controls to ensure that they have that right set of controls over their IP so that their employees don't inadvertently share it into one of these models and it gets kind of uploaded and then available for everybody and they kind of lose that IP. They don't realize what you're saying. They don't realize that they're actually contributing to the revised corpus with their IP, which then That's comes right. into all kinds of issues around IP rights and releases it essentially. That's right. That's right. Exactly it. And so, you know, I think if you're if you're 
bank number one, you want to make sure that your data doesn't get uh, loaded up into the model and so that bank number two can learn from what you're doing. A lot of great possibilities. I think one of the things that I've observed over the past 13 years um, covering you guys and, and 10 years at reInvent, looking forward to this year, is yeah. the makeup of your customers, right? You've had a mix of customers from early startups, then enterprise quick adoption, and then massive growth, more higher level services. You guys serve essentially every kind of customer at this point in every yeah. industry. And those customers want different things. And if you look at the enterprises today versus say ISVs, even of yesteryear and today, enterprises are merging with this kind of like super cloud mindset or ISVs just want to do SaaS. They all want different things. What are some of the key differences on how enterprises want to consume generative AI versus say how an ISV wants to consume it, generative AI? Yeah, I think, well, the, the first thing that you, you mentioned is, is spot on. I think everyone is going to want to use generative AI and, and appropriately so. It is a, a powerful technology that has a potential to help us be more efficient, more effective and really change customer experiences. I think when you think about those differences and how a startup thinks about things or how a large enterprise thinks about things or a SaaS provider thinks about things. Um, you know, a lot of them are not totally different um, as you might think their, their stages of adoption may be different. I think if you're a startup, you're trying to figure out how can you get out there fast? How can you iterate quickly? How can you get access to some of these technologies that may only normally be accessible to really large companies? And that's one of the things that cloud and AWS enable. And so you see startups like Hugging Face, like Stability, like Runway, like uh, I can go on and on anthropic building on top of AWS because they can get large scale capacity quickly, they can iterate quickly, they can learn and they can grow. So that's that's where a lot of startups love to use the cloud. And, and that was, as you know, that's where we kind of grew up from the, the very beginning is, is the value proposition and generative AI is no different there. I was talking I with Swan. Go, oh, right, that's right, interrupt, go ahead. I was say, when you go look at a larger scaled ISVs, it's really not that different of a story. I think one of the things that they love is the ability to scale the ability to test new capabilities. I think if you look at, um, you know, large ISVs like Adobe just launched uh, last week, new generative AI capabilities inside of their creative cloud. Really cool stuff that these larger established ISVs are doing and rolling out really innovative new technologies and capabilities all based on generative AI. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just was well, you just wait, I'm going down the same road I was thinking, which is enterprises have a little bit different needs than say a developer or startup that's growing rapidly enterprises might want SaaS-like experiences like Code Whisperer, right, for example, or developers wanting like say Bedrock for the building blocks. How do you mix that together? What's your take on that? Do you see that same thing, more SaaS for the consumption side? Developers want to build with Bedrock. Isn't yeah. that kind of where the action is? I mean, can you, where is the, I guess my question is, do you believe that to be true? And where's the action? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you like, uh, you know, John, I think really our take is there is no such thing as a homogenous customer. Customers all have different ways that they want to consume this technology. Some are going to want to consume it at a, a package layer. Some are going to want to consume it all the way at the infrastructure layer. And I think that's where AWS really shines and how our product strategy is, um, is that we want to have capabilities for everyone. We, for people that want to build their own models, we build our own silicon. And I think increasingly that is going to be a competitive advantage for us to have choice. We have, we, we have and for a long time have been the best place to run GPU infrastructure. And so customers love uh, running large scale GPU clusters in AWS, but we also build our own infrastructure that we think has costs and uh, performance advantages uh, in the sense of Trainium for large training, training clusters and Inferentia for running large inference clusters. If you think about SageMaker, it's a development platform of choice of almost every single ML developer out there to do things like make sure that you're doing safe AI make sure that you're testing various different models to see what actually works well with your application. And then Bedrock is providing an, an easy to use API so that the variety of models, whether you're using, uh, you know, we, we think that there over time, there's going to be a large number of these foundational models that folks are going to want to be able to use for a different set of use cases. And they may even want to combine different ones. And so Bedrock provides a really easy to use API so that customers can combine those. Um, now, now the one thing that I will say is, consistent across almost every single customer that wants to use generative AI is that they want to make sure that they do it in a secure, safe environment where they know that their IP is safe, where they can have explainability, where they have uh, as much information as possible on how the model was created. Um, and really that's where our focus is, is how can we give enterprises that assurance 
that they have the highest performing infrastructure, but also the best and most secure platform in order to go build that generative AI so that they know that their data and their IP doesn't leak out um, uh, to, to places where they don't control it. On the security thing, how do you ensure that? What's the key value proposition there? I mean, it sounds good. Back that up, be specific. What's, what's yeah. the security compliance? Is it, is it more um, regional thing? Is it you guys have with your architecture? What's the security, um, I guess, yeah. <laughs> housekeeping yeah, it, seal of approval from AWS? How do you ensure that? I, I, you know, I think there's, there's a range of things. For our, for our first party models, we have our own models, which we refer to as our Titan models. And those, we're very careful from a copyright perspective of which data has been used to build that model. So, and we're very clear about that. So customers know that they can be assured that uh, the data that went to build that model is, is something that we have the rights to use to go build it. We, we provide things like open source models inside of Jumpstart. And when you're running on some of those open source models, many of which are becoming really, really powerful and in many case, cases are actually outperforming some of the proprietary models today, customers are able to run those entirely inside of their own proprietary VPC or networking. And so they can run that model. There is, they can isolate that from any sort of external connectivity and know that anything that they use in that model stays inside of that model, stays inside of their VPC. The same with Bedrock, where people, anyone who uses any sort of uh, tuning to tune Bedrock models, which is one of the key features that we'll have inside of our Titan models, um, we ensure that that data doesn't leak back into the core foundational model and stays inside of the customer's VPC. So many of the controls that they use for the rest of their enterprise data uh, work just the same for their generative AI capabilities. And we think when we've talked to a lot of customers, they've come to trust AWS and our security models. They trust their data inside of AWS. And now when they run their generative models on top of some of that data, we can provide some of those same controls to help them understand how their data stays inside of their environment. I think that's a really great point. In fact, we've been talking about this whole prompt engineering wave where it's essentially a call. I mean, as a prompt is a call. I mean, prompt okay. tuning, that's operational. And then obviously not autonomous is just software. You mentioned choice earlier. I think that's a fundamental comment. I want to just double down on that. You guys have been known as a company, even Amazon from the early days of you know, selling books, choice. Now you guys yeah. got a broad selection of Jenna. You mentioned a few first party models, that's your model. Um, uh -huh. And OpenAI has theirs, it's not on AWS. And we'll come back to that in a second. Third party models via Bedrock, which you guys announced, which is getting a lot of traction. And then the yeah. recent wave of open source innovation, just in the past yeah. like month and a half, you saw a huge surge. You guys got a hugging face out there. Some of these individual models are clearly very more prominent, get that, and important. Looking ahead, when will customers want to use the prominent models that you guys have? And when will they want to use some of these long tail bedrock like yeah. products and open source? How will you balance those? Yeah, I mean, our, our goal is, is to give customers both the choice to be able to run what's best for their application because the model that's optimized for a financial services customer may not be the one that's optimized for genomics data, may not be the one that performs best for e-commerce or images or any of those other things. And that's why, you know, stability is a stability AI is a is a great model for images right now, but um, not for text. And by the way, they'll change over time and they'll add some of those. And so we want customers to be able to pick and choose what the best image that they are the best model that they want to use for the best use case. Um, and that's part of where SageMaker plays a big role. And we, we make it really easy for customers to A-B test things. And in a cloud, you can do that. You don't have to spend billions of dollars to go build your own model. You can leverage some of these others and test if model A performs better than model B, um, or if some combination of models is actually the optimal one for you. And I think over time, that's largely where people will land is they'll tune and, and kind of build on top of some of these foundational models and they'll have their own model that they that they tune and then condense from those, then that's the thing that they'll actually use in production. Um, and we want to make it super easy for them to do that process, but then also uh, cost effective and secure in order to actually use that and scale that out because cost is one of the long things people are looking out in the future and, and they're worrying about what the cost of generative AI is going to be. And so we focus on all areas of that to try to make sure that, that, that we can meet all of those concerns and, and have the best option for them, yeah. whether it's first party Amazon models or or models open source or, or other proprietary ones. We, our, our goal is over time to support every single model out there. That's awesome. And this whole conversation reminds me of early days of AWS when you had the same, do I build a data center and provision yeah. all this stuff or do I put it in the cloud and get instant value? 
variable elasticity. I mean, same kind of thing happening dynamic here with the, with the cloud and, yeah. and, and foundational models. It feels the same. You can stand up your own if you want. Good luck with that or mix and yeah. match and, and code mm -hmm. your own. That's right. And, and look, and over time you'll see us leveraging generative AI more and more in some of the applications that we make available to customers as well. I think you mentioned earlier, Code Whisperer um, is a great example of that where it's a coding companion, but still with that enterprise in mind, right? We're still, we have automated reasoning built in to make sure that you're building secure code. We have the ability to highlight if we're showing you code samples that come from open source, what is the licenses and to ensure that you want to use the code sample that comes from open source. These are, it, it starts from that fundamental uh, starting with the customer that we do and working backwards. And we, we really like to think, what are the things that customers are really going to care about when we roll these out? And our focus, you know, which is a little different than others, which is we are laser focused in AWS on how can we have generative AI make our customers successful and, um, you know, and, and a little bit less, you know, we're, we're not distracted by productivity suites or search or any of those other things. We are laser focused on how can we make sure that our AWS customers can take best advantage of these technologies? And we start with those use cases and then work from there. So Andy Jatsy's shareholder letter, he was very optimistic and bullish on this, basically saying this is a transformative time. Sure. Adam Selesky's comments as well, and what kind of what you're getting at. It reminds me of the old days of AWS, early days, you know, the Andy's would say, undifferentiated heavy, we automate away the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Well, kind That's of right. AI can do the same thing for differentiated heavy lifting. What's your reaction to that? Because now it, it can do both, right? You got the cloud for undifferentiated, all the, 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 the toil provisioning and all that stuff. Now you're seeing AI take on more tasks, shifting the human, augmenting mm -hmm. the human capabilities, so differentiating, seeing a lot of conversations today around how AI can actually automate and differentiate for companies. This is a big part of the refactoring on the business side. What's your reaction to that comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, I, I think generative AI is an incredibly powerful capability that has a, has a chance to make us much more efficient, much more effective, you know, it, it's not going to replace people uh, any anytime soon. You know, I think that's that's a, that's a long way off. A lot of people are worried about that, but you know, every time a new tool or capability comes out that's kind of transformational in what you can do, I think people worry a little bit about that. But if you think about Code Whisper, Code Whisper is not going to make it so that you don't need developers anymore. It's going to make it so developers don't have to write bespoke code. It's going to make it so that developers can write more secure code, but they can focus on some of that that piece that's like, what is the innovative customer experience that I can go deliver for my business and for customers and not have to worry about, you know, the blocking and tackling of, of necessarily writing code. I think, you know, the future coding language is probably going to be English and that's okay. You know, voice. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's, it's going to be saying it in English and then, and then the tools will, will, will translate that into code. And so, you know, the expertise may not be understanding the nuances of Java or C++ or anything like that, but that's okay. I don't think um, it doesn't make, it, it just changes some of that skill pieces. Now you got to think about the parts of your application that you want to go build as opposed to how you build it. So yeah, humans, you know, I think, plus, I think, humans plus AI is better than AI by itself. A hundred percent. Yep. And that's going to be like that for a really, really long time and probably forever. I think that's the big thing that we want to get out there is people shouldn't be afraid of it. It's an opportunity. I think it's one of the biggest ways we've seen combined all the other ones and we're, we're going to report it heavily. You mentioned GPUs. I want to jump on that real quick. So supply seems sure. to be a bottleneck. Um, NVIDIA stock is all high and I think they're kind of like hoarding all the GPUs in my opinion, but I won't get into that. Um, there's demand for the training and inference. What do you see as the core constraint in the industry and what does the industry have to do to have a line yeah. of sight to relieve the pressure. There's more demand. You mentioned you've got the GPU service. How, mm -hmm. how long do you expect it to take to clear this up and get, get, uh, get more freed up? You know, I think um, that, that's, that's a good question. I think there's a number of constraints here. I think one of the things that, that, um, uh, that, that's key is that it takes a lot of compute power um, to go build some of these uh, foundational models. It takes billions of dollars of GPUs, but not just GPUs, servers, networking, data center, power, electricity, um, all, all of those pieces, right? And um, we've been building a lot of those things for a long time. We have the largest GPU clusters uh, anywhere in the cloud. Uh, we have the best performing GPU clusters in the cloud. And long, long term, I think that power is actually one of those things that's, um, that, that you have to really think about because they, these clusters have the potential to use you know, hundreds of megawatts to gigawatts of power. Now, you know, by 2025, we'll be running all of our global data centers on renewable energy, which helps a lot because there's a risk that there's um, 
uh, that some of that power causes environmental issues. And so um, I'm super happy that we made that investment and commitment, uh, you know, 10 plus years ago to do that. And that's, that's great. But we're also going to, you know, we're going to want to think about how do we scale those in a bunch of different ways. And I think that's part of where our custom silicon comes in. Yep. GPUs are awesome. NVIDIA does a fantastic job of building a really good product. And they're going to be super important in this space for a really long time. But we also think there's space for custom design silicon. And we think that things like um, products like Tranium have the real potential to help customers lower cost over time, reduce the power footprint, and improve performance. And, you know, there's a lot of work to get there. Um, and there's a lot of innovation that's going to happen in the industry because of so much focus in this space. But, um, but we feel like we're at the forefront of that and um, can have a, a, a competitive advantage for our customers um, and for our business by having that low cost option for customers that actually, yeah. in, in some cases, can out, outperform what GPUs can do. Yeah, I think you're being a little bit humble there, Matt. You guys have had, I'll give you props, the silicon work and the physical layer. You guys have been squeezing every ounce of physics out of it at AWS for years. I've reported many stories on that with James Hamilton, Peter DeSantis, um, a lot of great work there. But that brings up a good point. You know, AI is all about chat GPT, which shows a ubiquity of it. Be always oh, writing a paper for me on blog posts and tweets. But the, the action of AI is up and down the stack. It's physical layer. It reminds me of the old OSI model back in the day. You mentioned physical, there's AI up and down the stack. And it's going to be startups are going to leverage this, not just for the application layer, but there's work to be done. Can you just share your thoughts on the kind of generative AI that's happening up and down the stack? I, I think that there's just going to be innovation across the board. I think every, every single industry, there's going to be innovation at networking. There's going to be innovation at the compute layer. There's going to be innovation at the tool layers. There's going to be innovation in, in supporting services like vector databases and other things like that. There's new startups that are popping up every day, focusing on, on different parts of that tool chain. And I think all of those things are really interesting. And, and as we've talked about, all the way up to the application stack where there's all sorts of new technologies. So I think it's a technology that can be applied almost anywhere. And, um, and that's part of what makes it super exciting. And uh, it's an incredibly fast moving space. And, you know, frankly, whatever we talk about this month, uh, you know, maybe totally different six months from now, there's a lot of folks out there innovating. And, and that's part of why AWS is great. We give people a platform to go innovate. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the one to, to guess what all those folks are going to go build with the, the capabilities we give them. Um, other than I know that they'll, they'll build some stuff that we don't expect. And that's, that's part of the, the fun of it. Well, our, just our surprise on SiliconANGLE and theCUBE is we stored all of our transcripts for 35,000 interviews in the cloud on Amazon. And we've been using Transcribe and other services. We have an index. Turns out it's a large language model. Hey, great. We're turning on <laughs> uh, Cube AI right now. So that kind of well, never would have been available had we not been leaning in. And this is something yeah. that I want to ask you because um, what I'm seeing in my reporting is that there's two types of customers right now on the AI side. There's ones that have been in the cloud and ones that aren't or not They've done lifts and shift, but not truly in the cloud. The pandemic showed us if you were leaning into the cloud, you had a tailwind. If not, you had a headwind. With AI, there's a feeling that if I don't lean in, I might be caught flat-footed like the folks that didn't get into the cloud with the pandemic. What's your reaction to that? Do you hear that? And what do you tell customers? Because it's not like just jump in because you have to, like there's a benefit for getting in there. We're here, I'm hearing that from customers saying, I'll put the toe in the water, I'll jump in, I'll play around, I'll explore, discover, but I don't want to be flat-footed like the pandemic where I didn't have leverage. That's right. I, I think that, that you're, you're exactly right. I think getting all of your data and your workloads in the cloud enables you to adjust to, to changing um, trends and technologies. And, and I do think generative AI is one of those that every single customer and company has to really think about how they're going to integrate into everything that they do. And it's harder if your data is not in the cloud. And so it, you know, almost like a, a step zero is to make sure your data is in, the, in AWS, that it's available in a data lake that you can look at, that your compute and workloads are there, that you have your structure around it. And so many of the customers who have already jumped in that cloud journey are in a good place to move fast. And others are hustling because they realize that this is capability that they're just not going to be able to do in their own data centers. There's just, there's just no way of doing it. The scale is just not possible. The speed, the technology is moving, it's just not possible to do in your own data centers. And so that I think this is further evidence and, and impetus for people to move to the cloud quickly. But I also encourage every single customer to be thinking about how generative AI is going to change their business um, over the next you know, many years. Or if you got a stack of GPUs, keep those and you know sell as a service opportunity there. Only kidding. <laughs> Last couple of questions just to end things. I really appreciate your time. I know you're super busy running 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 operations over there at Amazon Field and Global Services. Fun questions, thought exercises. You can answer any way you want. 
you know, they got OpenAI, which is not available on AWS, Anthropic, which is available on AWS. I've been talking to insiders and VC firms in some of the top enterprises, and they all mm -hmm. want open, they want choice. Okay, many mm -hmm. complain privately, they would like to see OpenAI run, out with, run with Bedrock. Would you ever yeah. offer Sam Altman lots of customers for OpenAI via Bedrock? Sure. Uh, there's no there. I would I will I would love to show. I I, I really like. I think all customers. I want to have choice, and so I would love to have every model that customers are interested and excited about running in in Bedrock and AWS. All right, there it is, open. Customers and developers on also want open source. So you're starting to see that there's been a big surge just in the yep. past month and a half. Mm -hmm. A lot of fruits of the labor from the open source community really jumping on uh, AI big time. We reported explosion yeah. of developer and entrepreneurial innovation and value mm -hmm. creation. This is the next area where the startups and the unicorns are going, the next Dropbox is going to be coming out of these communities uh, mm -hmm. all, all took advantage of AWS in the early days. You guys got mm -hmm. the big models, the long tail of open source models are emerging. What's mm -hmm. your view on the mix of the models, the big prominence of the open source long tail? How do you see the mix playing out? Do you have an opinion? Do you have a visibility into kind of how that might shake out in terms of mix? Yeah, I, I, it's hard to say. I think some of, we've, we've seen awesome results from some of the distilled open source models recently. Facebook's Llama model was awesome. I think uh, uh, there's a new model that just came out this week that's light on, I think, which is an even smaller model that's outperforming Llama now in the open source uh, world, totally trained on AWS. Um, you know, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of this interesting, uh, uh, a lot of interesting innovation that's going out there. I think there's also always going to be need for these really large core models too that help distill some of these open source models and specialized models. But um, but you know I think it's it's such a fast moving space. It's hard to say. That, that's why I think that the choice is so important. It, it's you know there's anybody's guess as to exactly which horse to bet on. Um, we we'd prefer to make it really easy for customers to switch horses if they find the one that they like better later. Matt, thanks so much for your time. Final question, as people ride this wave, it's a big one. If they're not on the wave riding it properly, they're going to be driftwood as we've been saying on theCUBE. What's your advice? There's a lot of change. You mentioned just some ex really good examples of you know, yeah. carbon footprint, which by the way, Stanford mm -hmm. did come out with a study saying it's worse than anything else, even crypto. So that's a good play for the cloud for you. Congratulations. And, but, but for startups out there, what's, what's your advice? Because the entrepreneurial huh? track is not the same as it was during gen one. You got to get customers, but scale is a huge thing. Which we've been saying, yeah. how do you see the, this next gen mm -hmm. wave hitting? What's your advice to startups yeah. and for companies? There's a lot of change. How do you keep on top of it? What would you advise? Hey, part of what we think about is, is that we think AWS is a great place for startups and, and all sorts of, of customers to, to to actually as a channel to get to customers. They're, you know, the vast majority of enterprises and companies out there are running their businesses in AWS, but we're not going to go build the broad swath of innovative new technologies. We'll, we'll deliver a lot of stuff, but there's a lot that we won't build. And, um, and partners are key to, to what, everything that we do in AWS. And so we have a lot of programs from marketplace all the way through to, to some of our channel programs and, um, and certifications to ensure that our partners are available for our customers to use in a really easy to, to use, really easy to integrate way. And so I'd encourage all of them to look at some of those programs that we have in the, in the partner ecosystem um, and in marketplace, as we're seeing that that's a, one of the ways that a lot of enterprises want to bring these tools together to be able to use a broad swath of things. Awesome, Matt Garman, Senior Vice President, Sales and Marketing and Global Services for AWS, continuing this next level it's legit, next gen AI's here, uh, super exciting. It is transformative. We, we love it and we love the, the change and accelerated towards business transformation. Matt, thanks for coming on theCUBE exclusive conversation. All right, thanks John, all happy right. to be here. Thanks. Bye. Hey, this is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier. Exclusive conversation with all the thought leaders and, and executives in the business making things happen. A, generative AI is the hottest changing trend happening right now. Obviously data's at the heart of it and cloud scale. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, thanks for watching.